This week we have Project Queen Unbi Kim, and she's teaching you how to create a space for yourself in the careers of music. Martin McCain and we are here to help you create your best musical life through transformational interviews performance content and educational tips I so enjoyed this interview with Umbi Kim and I know you will too so here it is hi everyone welcome back to elevate with the McCain duo this week we have Umbi Kim she is pianist extraordinaire and co-founder of bespoken and I actually got to interact with her in person before. <laughs> Welcome, Umbi. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a pleasure. We're super excited about this. And uh, it's nice when we've actually met. Umbi is new to Martin. So it's also kind of like people who have met and then an introduction at the same time. Um, so Umbi, we always like to start off with, like, what are you doing now? Uh, as a freelancer, what's kind of keeping you busy in this downtime, I'll say, for a lot of musicians? Um, I've been practicing, so that hasn't changed, but I've been kind of going back to the fundamentals of practicing, which has been really fun. Um, usually, be pro Pre-COVID, I'd always be kind of like scramming to learn music and things like that. So that's always so stressful. And it's really nice to have this time to kind of go back to basics and, and work with te technique and have some lessons with my teacher and work on repertoire that I'm not necessarily preparing to perform, but just want to learn. So that's been really great. Um, and I've been really focused on my mentorship program, Bespoken, because um, we're still running and actually we're, we've um, expanded and uh, just ready to open um, our fall round in October. So I've been really busy preparing for that. We were interviewing about 30 applicants of the, of the ones who applied. So we interviewed 15 people last weekend and then 15 people this upcoming weekend. So, so yeah. And then I've also uh, started this leadership program sponsored by American Express Ooh, and it's oh, for wow. women in music. And that's been really exciting too. It's my first time getting to work with like an executive coach and mm. also meet other women in music and leadership positions in music. So that's been a lot of fun. That is awesome. So <laughs> um, be spoken. I know that's like your, your brainchild. Can you tell our audience <laughs> about that? Sure, sure. Um, it was actually co-founded by my friend and colleague, Gina Izo, who's a flutist. And she worked at Chamber of Music America, uh, for several years and she was uh, the director of the national conference every year, which is where I met her. And um, one of the programs that she led at that conference was called Next Gen, which is a separate uh, initiative for conference attendees who are 25 and younger or still students. And so we noticed that after the conference, they would you know, be so inspired and still try to keep in touch. And um, so Bespoken was kind of uh, created with that in mind of, of all the people who, you know, get so much from going to the conference, but want to have like continuing that, that relationship. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so great. Wow. And so you said, do you guys model it the same way? So is it under 25 or who, who's your target audience? Oh. Who do you want to apply? <laughs> well, we don't have an age limit. At first we did. And then we heard from several people who were like, you know, my career hasn't started because of X, Y, Z. I've been working and I still consider myself an emerging artist. And, you know, mid-career artists need a lot of um, help too. Um, and even uh, very seasoned artists might need uh, mentorship in terms of things like social media. So we don't have an age limit, but we found that most people who, who apply are uh, people who are maybe two or three years out of school. So 
Um, we ask on the application if you're either a student or within five years of graduating. Nice. Wow. Okay, everybody listening who's within five years of graduating. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. So um, it seems like you're very passionate about mentorship. Like, how did that how did that come about? Well, I found that after I graduated, I graduated from Manhattan School of Music with my master's, and then I had all these ideas of different projects I wanted to pursue, and they were just really, really, really different, I think, than what I saw my peers doing, and um, and it was all new stuff. Like, it wasn't anything that I learned in school, and I had to kind of struggle and face a lot of these challenges and learn from experience kind of by myself. And I had some really great mentors along the way who guided me and gave me encouragement. And that always meant so much to me um, that I think this program is really designed for those same types of artists who are um, interested in, you know, creating their own path, um, creating projects that are new or different or have a different format and um, would like to um, work one-on-one -on -one with somebody to give that encouragement and also be part of a community where everybody is doing that, where everybody is trying to track their own path and do interesting things in music. Wow. Oh, yeah. I, I was calling, we were joking around, we were calling Umbi Project Queen because, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like seriously, on social media, it's just like, you're doing this, you're doing that. I'm like, wow. How does, I mean, it's like, how does she even keep track of all these things? So maybe tell somebody who is, like you said, maybe five years out of school or even mid-career or reinventing themselves later in their career. <laughs> like, how do you even come up with all these projects. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, some people are just like, I'm just a pianist, you know, like how would they even start? Like what kind of project do you create or how do you figure that out? Well, it's, that's a really great question. Um, I've, I've done lots of uh, lectures at universities of, about how to come up with a project if you've never had a project. And I think most people do. It's just they, they're maybe scared to say it out loud. And because we all have different passions and interests that may fall within music, but all, very often outside of music. And if you think of it in that way, like how you can combine maybe several of your other interests with uh, music, that could be one way to generate an idea. Or if you think back on um, your childhood and the things that you were naturally curious about, or even now what you would like to learn more about or um, would like to do, and it doesn't feel like work. Mm, doesn't feel like work. Wow. That is the most important thing because so many people, you know, they're just working to Pay take up, bills. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> to have a paycheck and they don't really think about it like that. So thank yeah. you. That's awesome. I also like um, what you said earlier when you're talking about, you know, a lot of people, I mean, all, all of our gigs stopped and you said you went back to the basics, you're working on your fundamentals, but you also said, like, I'm going out and playing for my teachers, too. And so like, yes. that, that meant so you're st even though like you're a, an amazing mentor, you're still getting mentorship, too. <laughs> yes, Which, of course. And I think we all need mentorship throughout various um, phases of our career. And it's so helpful. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So one other thing about projects. So this summer, or I guess it wasn't really summer. It was like almost before this summer, you had a project at the Kennedy Center. Congratulations yeah. um, oh, thank you. <laughs> with Daniel Bernard Rumain. And a lot of our listeners, you may already know who he is. DBR is his AKA. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but maybe you could tell them about who he is and then about your Kennedy Center project. Sure, sure. Um, Daniel Bernard Romain is a Haitian American composer, violinist, and I've worked with him since I think 2014. Um, he's written two um, major works for me. The first one was in 2015 called It Feels Like a Mountain Chasing Me. And that was also premiered at the Kennedy Center and also the Korean Consulate, which sponsored that whole um, commissioning project. And uh, very recently, he wrote a follow-up work called Songs for the Alone, and it was inspired by Prince's passing. And um, at the start of COVID, um, so I already had a relationship with the Kennedy Center mm -hmm. from past performances, and I, um, they, they were doing this, um, or maybe they still are doing a digital series 
called Couch Concerts. Mm-hmm. So I approached them about um, Daniel's work for me, which um, hadn't yet been premiered. And it's called Songs for the Alone, which is about isolation and, oh. and dealing with yourself. <laughs> I was like, this is really timely. Oh my yeah. God. You, but you guys did this before COVID, obviously. You had to yes. start it. Oh my God. Wow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it has elements of that kind of um, loneliness, but also hopefulness. And um, Daniel and I both thought it was it was very timely. And then uh, it was a sh- it was a double bill. So I performed this work, and I also performed a work by Tanya Leon, which Artina plays so beautifully. Oh. <laughs> I actually asked Artina for a recording of her. Oh, I, I have I one now. Tell you played it. It's coming out in a month. <laughs> oh, great! That's yeah. so great. <laughs> Because she told me that the recording that's out there now, uh, she wrote it for a pianist who played it a little bit slower than she w- would have liked, actually. Mm-hmm. Though that the tempo marking is actually uh, slower than than um, how she ultimately wanted it. But I love that piece so much. And so I ended the program with a Tanya Leon piece. Oh, oh fantastic. Awesome. <laughs> that is great. Okay. Well, I'm curious if somebody's listening, they're like, oh my gosh. And they know DBR. How does she yeah. get to know DBR? Yeah. How does she get a commission from, you know, a composer of that stature? Mm-hmm. Like, tell us, tell us your secrets. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's actually very simple. And I get asked this all the time. And, you know, I also worked with Fred Hirsch on my debut album. And he also wrote a work for me. So, so people ask me that all the time. How did you meet DVR? How did you meet Fred Hirsch? How did you, you know, and it's, it's very simple. The, the, the answer is very simple in that I went to a concert of Daniel's in 20. 20- 11, I guess. And I was still a student at Manhattan School of Music. And it was at Brooklyn Academy of Music. And he was doing his huge multimedia concert called Symphony on the Dance Floor. And I think that was one of the first times I went to a concert like that, a classical concert, where he was working with like uh, the Urban Bushwomen dance group and um, a DJ from Tribe Called Quest and, and, um, He worked with this amazing photographer who had this beautiful presentation and then his music was so incredible and it was like on this runway and and it was just this incredible energy and um, a reflection of of all the things that he was proud of, like his Haitian heritage. And I was like, I've never, ever, ever, ever seen anything like that in classical music. Mm. So afterwards um there was a line of people you know waiting to talk with them and then i was just like oh maybe i'll say hello and i like the <laughs> concert and <laughs> i'd like to work with them one day and and that's what i did i i actually i almost chickened out and i thought <laughs> okay I, i'll just write him an email but then i i i stayed and i said oh it's really nice to meet you i really like the concert and and one day I, i'd really love to work together and that, that was how I met him. Wow. That is so, you know what? I'm always telling my students, go talk to yeah. the people after the concert. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's, just gen- it's genuine, you know? I mean, just showing interest. That's awesome. Golly. Oh my goodness. Everybody hear that? Go talk to people after the yeah. concerts or, or nowadays leave a virtual comment <laughs> or something. <laughs> right, right. And I, yeah, and I thought it was sort of, it would sort of end like that. But then I think it's like a muscle that you kind of practice because I saw him again at a different concert at another person's concert. And he was in the audience and I said, Oh, hi. Um, I, do you remember me? We, we met at that concert at BAM two years ago. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we, we sort of kept in touch that way because I would see him and then I would just always make sure to say hi. Mm-hmm. And then the Korean consulate, um, used to have this open, uh, they called it an open stage series where it was um, a competition where you can write a proposal and they give small grants to artists in five different categories. So uh, music was one of them. And um, I asked Daniel, if I get this grant, would you write this work for me? Mm. Um, And then if I don't, then, then I don't. And it's sort of like a win-win. I mean, he doesn't have to do anything. I just apply and put his name and the, and the proposal. And then if I get the grant, then, then um, he would write the work, which is which is what happened. So I always tell students, you know, it, it all it also m- kind of messed with me because that was the first time I ever 
ever applied for a grant and I got oh. it. And then, <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> but then I've never gotten one again since. Oh, so. oh <laughs> but you went for the gold. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, it all worked out. And so then I emailed him and I said, I got the grant. And I don't think he expected me to have gotten it. So he was like, oh, okay, I guess I have to write, oh, write something for you. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's so cool. Wow. So like, how was the process um, with the most recent um, Kennedy um, performance? Like- well, it was interesting. I had never done a digital performance before. And this was the Kennedy Center. So they, they were working um, very hard with all the artists to make make this, you know, to optimize everything as much as possible. So um, in some regards, everything was very similar in that we still had a sound check and a dress rehearsal and run of show and all those things. And I had to learn like, you know, I need to get a mic and I need to get maybe two mics and then I need to get some lighting thing. And um, (laughs) so it was, it was really fun also because, well, what was different about um, this experience was how interactive it was with the audience because we were responding in real time after like each piece. So it would, it felt more like an interactive concert rather than um, a regular concert. And that, that was actually Daniel's idea. At first we were just, I was just going to play 30 minutes of music and Daniel was going to play 30 minutes of music. And then he, he was, um, he brought up the idea of us just chatting a little bit after each piece and then taking questions like, throughout the concert rather than what most people do, which is like at the very end of the concert, reserving like 10 minutes to do all of that. So it, 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 ended, it ended up working really well. Wow. Wow. I feel like that's going to be the future of concerts, to be honest with you. And and I think it's pretty awesome. I mean, we've done, we've done some too recently and it's nice just to be able to interact with the audience in a completely different way. Um, just through, through chats. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wonder how this is all going to play out. I guess we will find out, won't we? Yeah. <laughs> so, we will. Yeah. I know. <laughs> so maybe let's go back in time. How did you become a pianist and from the start? Well, you know, it's, it's a good question. I mean, I think my parents... Um, so um, the first 10 years of my life, we... Um, we weren't fancy people. We were, we were like, we lived below poverty. So mm-hmm. my parents wanted to give me piano lessons because they thought that's what fancy people do. Oh. And <laughs> it's, it's true. They really thought that I should have exposure to um, a different world than the one they, um, they were only able to provide me. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, it meant a lot to them that their daughter would play in recitals for example even if it was just like the sneak dance from method book level two you know (laughs) that's a a really good song (laughs) and so I think that's kind of um what was the impetus but I also always loved music and I loved performing so they thought you know this would be a great outlet for me and at the same time I could uh, be exposed to different kinds of people and um, have a chance to to do things that maybe um, kids around me weren't weren't doing as much. Wow, wow. So I I'm, love that. I'm curious. So, when did you know that you wanted to do music for a living? Hmm. I think I think forever. You know, in wow. school when they say, "What do you want to be when you grow up?" and I said, "I I want to be a pianist." Wow. wow. That is not commonplace all the time. Right. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> that is awesome. So I hear you, you know, I love that you shared that your family was below the poverty line. And I think a lot of times, especially classical music, it's a privilege, right? Yep. I mean, lessons are expensive. Yep. I mean, the, the good ones, so to speak, right? <laughs> the best right. teachers are expensive. And, and sometimes you don't even have access, depending on the community that you're in. You might not even have music in your school. You, you don't see a concert hall. So like, what was that like to overcome that to, like you say, just, oh, I always want to do this because a lot of people in that situation, they probably don't, they probably don't see themselves doing that because they don't see anybody else around them yeah. doing that. It's and like, they might not have. It's not for us. That's like the first thing you think. Yeah. You know? It's not for me. Yeah. Or it's not for us. Oh, 
I don't know. I think I just had always had a really big imagination and my parents never said that I couldn't do it. So mm-hmm. it, it didn't even occur to me as a child that this is not something that I could do or it's not for people like me or maybe it's really hard to do. Like they never once said like that's that's really difficult to do. They were always just like, oh, that's that's great. So just you know, listen to your piano teacher and and just do everything they say. So I think um, it didn't, yeah, it didn't even enter my mind that that um, it wasn't a possibility. Mm. So um, I think my parents wanted to keep my kind of childlike naivete, like for as long as possible. <laughs> so that's probably that probably contributed to this. Yes, oh, for yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, so you had supportive parents too, because I mean, I feel like that's that is. Half, I mean, that's a big thing. I mean, if you don't have supportive parents, usually, I mean, it's going to become a hobby. And so, mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's amazing that you, know, you have that support system. Yeah. But if you don't, you can go to her mentor program. <laughs> and it's exactly. never too late. <laughs> <laughs> well, that happens, too, where some of the mentees are like, my parents are really worried about me. <laughs> and... <laughs> It, and, and, you know, it's, that's, yeah, that can be a huge challenge. And I say, my parents were worried about me too. I mean, it's one thing when you're a kid and you say, you know, when I grow up, I want to be a pianist and I want to perform in all the concert halls and, and wear fancy dresses. And it's another thing when, when you graduate with a lot of debt and you're looking for a job mm. and, you know, with one mentee, she was going to all these jam sessions by herself, like at all hours of the night. And I'm like, what, what parent wouldn't be worried, you know, <laughs> if, if their daughter was doing that so i think um yeah that's all that's a very common topic the, yeah that's great <laughs> wow so many interesting things i have a big imagination i love that guys have a big imagination like umbi and you can get wherever you want to be actually <laughs> so well, i'm a firm believer that we kind of create our own reality in mm-hmm. a way like everything we can imagine can become real and i sort of You know, I was always like that as a kid and I try to, you know, keep that imagination as as much as possible. Otherwise, I think it's very easy to say something is is impossible or something is difficult to do or maybe those people were just lucky or maybe those people just had access and I didn't, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm. Definitely. So, you know, since like you're really, really big on mentorship and a lot of our audience are like up and coming, budding musicians, um, what advice could you tell them? Uh, you, could you give them just to know that, you know, it's, it's possible you can make it? Well, um, hmm. well, I think all throughout um, our training and, and being in school, I think the goal is to just be really good at at um, being like everybody else and sounding like everybody else and and doing what we're told. And then once you graduate, you're sort of on your own and you can just do anything that you want. And I think if you realize that um, after you graduate, you can do anything that you want. Um, the, the the music that you're interested in, like if you if you majored in classical music and you want to venture into uh, non classical music or even pop music, that's totally possible. So I think it's really about listening to yourself and not comparing yourself to other people, and also kind of figuring out what how you define success and. And, and, you know, you don't have anything to lose. I think after you graduate, especially it's the best time because you don't really have anything to lose. Right, right. right. I know. <laughs> you might as well try. <laughs> you might as well try. You know, you know David Chang, um, the, the uh, chef and the restaurateur, he, he gave this talk one time and he said 27 is the most creative age. And he, that's when he started Momofuku. And he said it's because you have a couple of years of experience, so you know some things, right. but you don't know too much, and you're not jaded, and you don't really have that much to lose. Nobody's expecting anything from you. So because yeah. when we started Momofuku, everybody thought he was crazy and that it was just going to fail after a year. And so then he just decided, well, why don't I just try? And then if that's the worst that could happen, then that's, you know then that's fine with me. So right. I thought about that. And I think that's true, you know? So I think after you graduate, that time is really precious and, yeah. and it's good to take advantage. 
That's awesome. So, yeah. hey, if you're 27 or 26 <laughs> or 28, let's, we'll give them 28 too. 28, you're not quite jaded. <laughs> downhill if you're turning 29. But anyway, <laughs> that is awesome, actually. Yeah, you're right. Like, you still, you know just enough to to have some credentials on yep. the street, you know, yep. but not too much <laughs> to be <laughs> Right. <laughs> right. And, you, and at that age, you're just sort of like – like just fearless. And I sort of see that in myself too. I think I did things then that I don't think I could do now. Mm. Like, I don't think I can perform Bach by memory now. Oh, (laughs) (laughs) I have retired from playing Bach. And I tell my students, I'm look, look, I retired about 10 years ago, but you are going to play it. (laughs) Right. I paid my dues. I I played this by memory. I don't have to do it anymore. I still have all the recordings if you would like to watch me play Bach, but you will not anymore. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it's funny but whenever they age, say- I did all kinds of crazy things, like, like memorize an entire concerto and perform it. I mean, it, it used to just drive my teachers crazy, but it, like there's a time when you can kind of do that. Yep. Yeah, and I think mm-hmm. that is probably the best time where you can just experiment and just go for it. And, and, you know, I know lots of people now, and now that I've been out of school for almost 10 years, I think I've, I know many, many of my friends who gone on to do different, uh, different things or enter different fields. And I think that's great too. You know, I, you know, I think music is one of the only kind of industries where if you go into study, go into college studying music, and then you go on to doing something else, somehow that's like a failure. But I don't see that at all. I, I read a statistic that more than half, like more than half the people who major in something usually go into a, a different field other than their major. But right. in music, there's this weird standard where you have to stay in music forever or else. But yeah, I really don't think so. So it's like, so if you don't if you don't want to go for it and you just want to change and pivot completely to a different field, I think that can be very successful too. It just depends on each person. Yeah, that's, absolutely. I love that. And music is such a gift, regardless of if you major in it or not. And just to have that understanding that you can enjoy a concert, I mm-hmm. I think that's really nice, actually. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. So this has been great. Yeah. Um, tell them what, what do you have coming up next or any projects that you want to advertise? Cause you are a project queen. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I think I should, I should label myself as that. <laughs> project queen. Um, well, I'm working on my, on my next album and I'm figuring out um, how to curate that and, and solidify the concept and, and how I would like to, uh, branded and marketed and also uh, the timeline for that. So I think um, my second album will be new music. Um, definitely I'm going to record the two uh, works by DBR. And I'm also, I just commissioned um, a wonderful composer, Angelica Negron, who's writing a piece for me for solo piano and electronics. So I think this is a great like time for incubation. Um, and sort of developing these ideas. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm also working with this really incredible filmmakers, uh, Simone Barros. And um, I'm recording this work written for me by Alan Sean, and she's creating some really beautiful experimental film with it. So um, yeah, so just a couple of things I'm doing and- Just a couple. (laughs) (laughs) Like a couple. (laughs) Those are all really amazing. (laughs) Okay, so- Umbi, can you tell our audience where they can find you, like your website and your social media accounts? Sure, sure. Um, my website is umbikenmusic.com and all my social media handles are umbikenpiano and I hang out a lot on uh, Instagram, especially if you want to connect there, just say hi. That is awesome. Everything you have shared has been amazing. <laughs> are so thankful that you could come talk with us today thank you guys for listening and thank you thank you for having me again next week bye everyone isn't she amazing that was a lot of great information (laughs) that's what we call her project queen because she has so many projects (laughs) so if you like what you see make sure that you're sharing with a friend 
and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit that little bell so you get the notifications. Also, you can check us out on our website, McCainduo.com, and on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, at McCainduo. See you soon.